Hi and welcome! This is part 1 of a series about how to improve the performance of the M54 Phoenix in DCS by means of manual loft. This part introduces the missile basic characteristics and functioning principles. Understanding the missile is fact is necessary, otherwise our efforts may actually be counterproductive. Part 2 instead is focused on the results and observations. Let's start by clarifying what manual loft means. This is a simple concept, the idea is pulling the nose of the fighter before releasing the missile. This gives it a free upwards momentum, allowing the missile to reach higher altitude levels where the air is less dense. The altitude excess is then cashed in by the missile when it dives onto the target. The result is a faster and thus more dangerous missile at impact. If we don't screw up, of course. Lofting is nothing new, and this is something I played with back in Lomak about 20 years ago. Them, I'm old. Uh, when I returned to the fixed wing aircraft with the release of the Tonkin in 2019, I actually scored my first PvP kill with the M7 by manually lofting it against the Su 27 at about 39 miles. He probably did not expect the M7 to arrive that far, so he did not defend properly enough. The recent M7 study I made at the end of 2022 highlighted once again how effective manual lofting can be. In particular, the study allowed to find the sweet spot for the manual loft of the M7, which is actually a rather straightforward relation, so pitch angle equals distance. When engaging a target at 20 nautical miles, for example, the most beneficial pitch angle is 20 degrees. Other values may work as well, but they may not take full advantage of the maneuver, providing diminishing returns or in some cases, trashing the missile. What about the M54 Phoenix instead? Back in 2019, I played with loft a little. But the performance of the old Mark 60 rocket motor was so good that I felt it was overkill. The new Phoenix does not possess the incredible thrust it had before, and its main strength is now the trajectory, rather than the rocket motor. Note that the current M54 is not finalized and is still work in progress. As mentioned earlier, part 2 discusses the results of the study, but we need to understand how the M54 Phoenix works before proceeding. To achieve this, we can use an elementary example and my ineffable drawing skills. Imagine a goalkeeper. He has the ball. He wants to throw it to the strikers on the other side of the football field. As we know, the goalkeeper usually kicks the ball forward and upwards. The ball flies and gains altitude, and at a certain point, the initial energy given by the kick runs out. The ball decelerates, continuing by virtual up inertia, reaches the apex, and then starts to descend. This is where altitude gained is cashed in, and the ball proceeds further until it reaches the ground. What if instead the goalkeeper were to kick the ball horizontally? As we know in this case, the ball will continue only until the initial force is active. As it dwindles, the ball gets in contact with the grass, which creates much more friction than the air, and the ball soon stops. Since we are here, let's see the opposite extremity. If the goalkeeper kicks the ball vertically, the ball goes upwards, but makes very little progress on the horizontal plane. Uh, we call this a bell tower when we were kids. If you are not new to this channel, we have seen this before when I discussed the topic of engaging jamming targets. One example showed what happens when the M54 is overlofted. Long story short, the missile is not trashed, but is rarely a threat either. Note that this particular trajectory is not unique to the Phoenix. Some examples include the M7 Sparrow, versions MH and P, and the M120 Amram. So what is the difference between these three missiles? To figure it out, let's have a look at this table. And this table shows some of the characteristics of the three most common missiles in DCS, for, at least for the blue side. Data is from the early 2000s, and the metric values are approximated. There is really not much to say, the numbers speak for themselves. The M54 Phoenix is absolutely huge. You can almost fit two M7 Sparrows in a Phoenix. So, what is a good place to have this missile fly whilst it chases its target? Yep, you're right, high altitude, with its juicy, less dense air. Although missiles like this thinner air, uh, this absolutely monster of a missile is the one that needs it the most to fulfill its purpose. In fact, another difference between the three is that the M54 is a long-range missile. It needs to reach a considerable altitude to thrive, and to achieve this, the rocket motor burns for a surprisingly long time. Then it cruises at a speed of between Mach 2 and Mach 2.5, gently trading altitude for speed, and finally dives onto the target, and in this phase, the Phoenix often accelerates. 
However, variation in geometry caused the WCS to steer the missile, thus affecting its performance. To no one's surprise, steering such a huge piece of metal, once the rocket motor is exhausted, costs the missile a lot of energy. Nevertheless, the Phoenix is a quite agile missile. Even the old A version managed to pull 16 Gs during a test in the early 70s, and the C is even more capable. However, this comes at a cost. The Phoenix may be able to pull considerable Gs, but it does so quite inefficiently compared to others due to its size and weight. The A120, for example, is incredibly nimble in comparison and loses less energy whilst maneuvering. So, to wrap up part one of this series, let's recap what we have discussed. So, point one, the Phoenix is a long-range missile. The A120 and M7 are medium-range missiles. Their flight envelopes and characteristics are not directly comparable. Two, the Phoenix needs and loves to fly high in order to get far. Three, the Phoenix is not particularly fast, and it does not need to be. Four, the Phoenix is massive, and it drains energy rapidly when it has to maneuver. Point one is a common mistake. Although all three missiles mentioned here are air to -air missiles, they have different purposes, and they were conceptualized and were developed in different eras, and they behave very differently. On a similar note, both the AGM-65 and the 9K-121 are air to ground missiles, but they are incredibly different. 2. The Phoenix partially addresses this point itself by means of the missile intrinsic behavior and trajectory. However, flying our F-14 Tomcat I and Menoloft help to improve this point. We already know that the impact of the altitude is massive and we will discuss how much Menoloft helps in the next video. Point 3 and 4 are related and they both flow into topics such as geometry and situational awareness. Increasing the speed of the F-14 helps, of course, but abusing IVC, monitoring manipulating target aspect and antenna train angle, and understanding and choosing the target correctly help even more. Here is where a good virtual radar intercept officer shines, because these factors are more important than any manual loft we may add to the equation. And I stress it once again, there is no point focusing on manual loft when we are trying to engage a flanking target at 80 nautical miles, but we think it's good because we cannot interpret the tactical formation display in aircraft stabilized mode correctly. So, if you're new and not familiar with the terms I just used, do yourself a favor and check those concepts before proceeding. Their impact on the final result is much, much higher than manual loft. And with that, we close this video. Part 2 will show the practical effects of manual loft and how this technique can help to improve your odds of hitting your target. Thanks for watching and take care.